This is the book Winchy, Mission Stories of Colin and Melva Winch by S. Ross Goldstone. The true adventures of missionary pilots and nurses in the South Pacific, as retold to the children of Watertown SDA Church. I'm your storyteller, Austin Backus. Let's go. The chapter this week is entitled Earthquake. For anyone who has lived in Papua New Guinea, the name Rabal will inevitably be associated with earthquakes. It is a town in the East New Britain province of Papua New Guinea with a beautiful circular harbor, but located very close to active volcanoes. And over the years, volcanic activity and earthquakes have been a constant concern. A series of major earthquakes occurred in 1971, followed by a destructive tsunami. The Winch family was resident in Rabal at that time. Late in July, Colin had flown Pastor Gordon Lee and Ted Jones to Kita in Bougainville, where they parked the plane and were picked up by the local mission president and taken to meetings in Roomba, where there was a central boarding school. Pastor Lee preached the evening sermon and everyone retired to their beds. In the middle of the night, the houses began to rattle and shake. Being built on stilts, they even swayed as a strong earthquake rippled through the area. Even though the epicenter was some 150 miles away in the sea south of Rabal, the result was that the fridge doors burst open, the contents spilled out on the floor, books were dislodged from shelves, adding all to the chaos. Without any fuss, the visitors climbed out of their beds and returned the spill food to the fridge. They just left the books in a heap on the floor until the morning. They returned to their beds and went to sleep. It was just another earthquake. The next morning, July 26, 1971, the three men returned to Kita, where Colin went through the usual routine of carefully checking the plane prior to takeoff. Following a prayer for protection, the engines roared into life and they commenced their 90-minute flight to Rabal. As they flew over the ocean, a strange sight appeared below. It was as if someone had dropped a huge rock into the ocean, causing rippling waves going on in all directions. Gordon Lee described it as similar to what happens when someone pulls the plug on a bathtub full of water, only this vortex was on a much grander scale. Colin reported the site to Flight Service Control to be informed, you're right over the epicenter of an 8.7 earthquake. Such a strong earthquake would create a tsunami. As Colin circled the area viewing the phenomenon, a request came through asking him to divert to Nissan Island, a low-lying inhabited atoll with which radio contact had been lost. It was feared the island might have been totally destroyed by the tsunami. Responding to the request, Colin flew low over Nissan Island to find that all was well, except that the radio masts were down, hence no radio contact. When the radio was switched to Rabal Airport Control, Colin was instructed to land short as a major section of the runway at Rabal had been cracked by the earthquake. When the J.L. Tucker safely landed in Rabal, the Winch children excitedly surrounded their father, all wanted to talk at the same time about the tsunami. The water level in the Simpson Harbor had risen and then fallen about 11 feet, leaving the harbor bed totally dry. Excitedly, the children rushed down to view the phenomenon, only to be told by a national policeman, Go back! Go back! Water! He come! Soon the water came rushing back, gathering speed as it flooded into the town, rushing through doors and windows on its path of destruction. The waves washed back and forth like water in a gold mining pan. The Winch children saw a Volkswagen car floating in the water while tethered to a veranda post. Mango Avenue was the town's main road and contained the supermarkets and the two main stores. Most of their goods and produce were thrown from the shelves by the earthquake and then inundated by water from the tsunami. Loss for some is gain for others, and the residents of Rabal benefited from cheap prices for some time. Some of the town's children thought Christmas had come in July when they found cans of soft drink and food washing down from the stores down the roads. They also rejoiced in the two weeks free from classes, as their classrooms had been damaged and the strong aftershocks were considered life-threatening if the children should be trapped in already damaged classrooms. With the aftershocks occurring on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, many of the Chinese residents and shopkeepers simply fled the town. The Winch children became amateur seismologists, claiming that they could tell when another shake was coming. Colin was doubtful until they let him outside and before long said, Dad, it's coming. We can hear it. Sure enough, there was a drumming noise from the water tanks as the quake approached. Children also claimed to be able to see the quake approaching. In even greater doubt, Colin was taken out in the middle of a straight road where they all waited. There, look, he was told. I can't see anything, Colin responded. Look down the road, Dad. Colin then saw the road rising and falling in a ripple effect as the quake progressed toward them and was felt underfoot. As a result of the series of earthquakes, many of the roads were badly damaged. Approximately 12 miles from a ball, the staff houses at Sonoma College, built up on stilts, had to be braced by galvanized pipe stays on all four corners. 
The Adventist harbor village of Matapit suddenly found it was given a large beach as the quake forced the earth upward. The Winch family thanked the Lord for their safekeeping in such dangerous but exciting times, and the memory of their experience at Rabal remains a highlight in the children's minds. The next chapter is called A Critical Omission. In anticipation of Papua New Guinea being granted independence, the Seventh-day Adventist Church voted in 1972 to realign the Island Union missions. Rabal being located in Papua New Guinea, it became necessary to relocate the headquarters for the newly formed Western Pacific Union Mission. These were built at Honiara. Colin recalls the day that he and Gordon Lee, president of the Union Mission, walked over the land determining where buildings should be located. One day soon after, Pastor Lee was on a commercial flight, seated alongside a businessman looking to expand his earth-moving business into the Solomon Islands. He was searching for a site on which to park his heavy equipment. Pastor Lee saw it as a God-given opportunity. He offered to have the equipment on mission land on the condition that the church could use the bulldozer for a couple of weeks. Prior to working for the church, he had worked with heavy earth-moving equipment. A deal was struck, and the leveling of building sites was done for only the cost of fuel to the church. The Winch family moved to Honiara in 1973. Colin continued his work as Union Pilot Youth and Health Director. On one occasion, Colin and Max Miller, the Education and Temperance Director of the Western Pacific Union Mission, had completed an itinerary of the New Hebrides Mission and were about to fly from Santo to the church headquarters in Honiara. Seeing that the plane was lightly loaded, Colin decided to fill all the available tanks with aviation fuel, since the fuel was cheaper in Santo than in Honiara, where he was headed. The 160 gallons involved would achieve a considerable saving of money. While the tanks were being filled, Colin completed the paperwork required for the international flight. Commercial pilots have this work done for them, but not pilots of private flights. Passenger manifests, cargo manifests, and a host of other documentation had to be completed. He then commenced checking the plane for the three-hour flight across the Coral Sea to Honiara. He carefully checked that the refueling vehicle had not damaged the external skin of the plane and was in the process of making these checks when the person who had refueled the plane called for him to sign the receipt for the fuel. On return, he failed to check the petrol cap on the outboard starboard wing. The person refueling the plane would normally clamp the cap shut, but it was Colin's responsibility to make doubly sure that this had been done. Having satisfactorily completed all the paperwork, Colin took off on a cloudy morning, climbed to 8,500 feet to clear Mount Tabue Masana on the western side of the island, then set a direct course for Honiara. Visibility was good over the Coral Sea, and not being under time pressure, Colin throttled back the engines to achieve the most economical flight, setting the plane on autopilot. A few minutes before reaching the critical halfway point of the journey, Colin looked out to the starboard and noticed that the petrol cap on the starboard tip tank was not properly shut. It was venting. Fuel was being sucked out of the tank by the air pressure. He had two choices, keep going to Honiara or return to Santo. <laughs> Colin weighed up the alternatives. He didn't like the idea of flying over the Santo Mountains again with a fuel problem, but on the other hand, a forced landing into the Coral Sea also lacked appeal. He decided to keep going, as Honiara had better firefighting equipment than Santo, even though the flight time was the same. He decided to switch both engines on to the venting tank to use up the remaining fuel quickly and minimize the loss. This would have two consequences. The plane would now become unbalanced, and should the tank be sucked dry, there was a risk of engine failure. Switching to the starboard tank, Colin carefully monitored the fuel pressure gauge. Max had also noted the venting and drew Colin's attention to it. He tended to be a nervous flyer, so Colin assured him everything was under control. Colin estimated that having filled all tanks in Santo, there should be a reserve of approximately five hours flying time when they landed in Honiara. The secret to successfully dealing with the situation was when to switch from the venting tank to the tanks on the port wing. When Colin estimated there might be half hour of fuel left in the venting tank, he switched one of the engines to a full tank on the port wing while still carefully monitoring the fuel pressure gauge on the venting tank. As soon as the pressure began to drop, the second engine was switched over to a full starboard tank. Without further drama, the flight was completed and they landed safely in Honiara. But Colin castigated himself for his carelessness. He mulled over how he failed to make the appropriate check. Time and again, he had stressed to other mission pilots to never allow themselves to be distracted when making pre-flight checks, and now he had broken his own rule. Had he not filled all the tanks at Santo, the flight might have had a different ending. Prayers of thankfulness ascended to God that night. Be sure to tune in next time for more stories from the book Winchy by S. Ross Goldstone, which is available at the Adventist Book Center. And meanwhile, check out these videos and others on my channel with many more mission stories and Bible skits for kids and adults. God bless you.